my topic, the thing I've chosen to study is uh, familiar to everybody here. It's joint speech, which is a term I've devised to simply pick out those occasions when multiple people say the same thing at the same time. That's so familiar, it hardly even bears describing. And yet, in studying it, I've come to realize both that we can learn an awful lot from studying such situations, and that we have a bit of a blind spot there, because there is essentially no scientific body of work on the topic. So I'd like to introduce my topic to you, um, to convince you that it's worth studying, and point out why it's difficult to study as well. But in order to do that, I have to go back a little bit and start with the voice. Why are ventriloquist dolls so creepy? <laughs> they are. They've spawned a whole subgenre of horror films. Anthony Hopkins in Magic, Chucky in Child's Play. I could go on. There's a list of about 40 or 50 horror films that star ventriloquist dolls. They do have the creepy little eyes, but mostly it's that voice that comes from the soulless heart. I don't know, I'm not sure, but, but voices coming from unexpected places have not always been regarded as a form of children's entertainment. Um, if you go back to the Middle Ages and their voices coming from unexpected places, we're probably dealing with a case of demonic possession. When voices start to come from stomachs or from the corner of the room, we are taken aback. And there's one question we never ask, which is how did the stomach learn to speak or how did the corner of the room learn to speak? Instead, we ask who's in there, who is speaking. There is something about voices that they bring into being a subjectivity, a subject. Someone speaks when there is a voice there. Stephen Connor, who's a professor of English in Cambridge University, has written a wonderful book on the history of ventriloquism from the Delphic Oracle, another pregnant case of a voice emanating from an odd place, to the present day Rod Hull emu funny kind of ventriloquism. It's called Dumbstruck. And Stephen points out an interesting fact, that the voice is one means by which we can be identified. It's a biomarker, much like a fingerprint or an iris or your gait. But unlike all these, when we give voice, that act of giving voice, as he says, simultaneously produces articulate sound and produces myself as a self-producing being. He's from the humanities because the science the sciences do not yet have a term. We don't have a language with which we can recognize and acknowledge this origin, the arising of a subjectivity in the act of giving voice. And so I come to my topic of joint speech. And I want to just describe some very, very familiar characteristics of joint speech to you. Um, and one of the first things I'll notice is that if you think of speech as some means of carrying on a conversation or a monologue like this, well, joint speech is a little bit different. When the, we speak jointly, the standard distinction between speakers and listeners is obliterated. Everybody is both a speaker and a listener at the same time, so we, we have to adopt a different perspective. Interestingly, another familiar dichotomy between speech and music goes away as well. The English word chant nicely spans the domain of the shouts of protesters and the Gregorian chant of the monks of Glenstall Abbey. So we've got everything in between. So there's no longer a distinction between speech and music. That's interesting. When we define joint speech as multiple people saying the same thing at the same time, we pick out domains of human activity. And I'd like to go through those a little bit because they're the domains that are so picked out are themselves interesting. The first one, and by far the biggest, is prayer. No matter what religion you belong to, if you belong to a religion, then within your religion there will be practices of prayer. There will be practices typically developed into uh, rituals that persevere over hundreds, even thousands of years, in which people come together and say the same thing at the same time. And if we look at these practices, clearly this has nothing to do with which faith you belong to, because we find this in all faiths. We find a great deal of repetition, whether you're saying the rosary, but the Buddhists and the Hindus and the Muslims do this as well. They repeat prayers again and again and again. We get a great deal of repetition. The musical elements of the voice are accentuated. We get very highly stylized forms of melodies and rhythms which are introduced so that, as I said, the boundary between speech and music becomes somewhat blurred. We get a great deal of redundancy. There are certain structures that recall uh, recur again and again. We find call and response, for example. 
a mob or a crowd has a hard time articulating a complex proposition, but if the priest or imam can articulate the complex proposition, that can be given voice by the crowd through the act of a generalized form of assent, the amen, also found in every religious tradition, a means of collectively buying in to a complex message. We find the obligatory association of the speech with gestures. Everybody kneels, stands up, bows, beats their breast at the same time. So we've got these interesting stylistic characteristics of the voice that we find in prayer. Prayer on its own is a little bit of an odd domain and I wouldn't have stumbled on it, but I chose instead to look at situations in which people say the same thing at the same time. And the next domain to be picked out, which is also very large, is that of protest. And I like to think that protest and prayer make odd bedfellows. And yet in protest we find repetition again and again, a great deal of redundancy, we find call and response, we find the musical elements exaggerated, we find rhythmicity and stylized melodic contours, we find stable forms that persist, where prayers persist over generations, we find forms of protest persist. The original call from the Allende campaign in 1973 in Chile, El Puebla Unida Jamás Será Vencido, the people united will never be defeated, is currently the call of the tragically misnamed Arab Spring, Ashab Yurit Iskat An Izam, the people demand the fall of the regime. It's exactly the same prosodic form that we find recurring. So we find an awful lot of superficial similarities, and I'm far more interested in superficial similarities because I can observe them. The third domain couldn't be more different. Not every sports has a chanting tradition, rugby doesn't, has a singing tradition but not a chanting tradition, soccer has a very rich chanting tradition, and again, while there are domain specific characteristics, sport is not prayer, sports chanting is not praying, we find repetition, and here we're beginning to see what's actually going on in the repetition, that is people are taking part, it's participatory, and the repetition can only really be accounted for by the fact that in speaking, we are enacting something, enacting a common identity as Manchester United supporters, enacting a common identity as Christians, enacting a common identity as people opposed to climate change. We enact something, we do something by participating in this, and there's an urgency and a performativity that inheres necessarily when people say the same thing at the same time. So these three are the, these are the three principal domains, and there are very many others in which we occasionally find uses of joint speech. And now, having identified these characteristics, we can look at other examples and see, well, what can we learn about those? There's an interesting one which I'd like to adduce at this point, which is the swearing of oaths of allegiance. If you become a new citizen of a country of Ireland, or most countries, you're required to stand up in public, raise your hand, there's the gesture again, and speak in synchrony along with, a, um, with others, following a text given, so we've got the call and response, with a very specific form here, it's called mirroring, where a text given by the leader is then repeated verbatim by the, I won't call them a congregation, by the group. Um, the hand is held here or here. Um, we find this particular performance, usually done as a single rite of passage as you become something, um, but sometimes also in American schools the Pledge of Allegiance is recited regularly by patriotic kids, and they might be surprised to find the exact same form used by radical Muslim groups as they pledge bayah to the so to the Caliph of the Islamic State. They use exactly the same form, the same body gestures, the same performative action in public. So I hopefully made a case that there is something that's worth looking here, uh, but there is no body of science here. I had to invent the term joint speech to cover multiple situations, choral speaking, chanting, and so on. There's a diversity of terms, and there's virtually no scientific work. So is that because one cannot do science? No. I came to this from an unusual perspective. I I'm a phonetician, I was interested in studying speech rhythm, and I was interested in speech as a form of highly coordinated movement. And I discovered that if you get two people into your lab, like these gentlemen, and you give them a text they've never seen before, and you say, please synchronize, three, two, one. There is, according to legend, a boiling pot of gold at one end. People look, but no one ever finds it. When a man looks for something beyond his reach, his friend saves looking for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. They are brilliant. They are brilliant at it and they can do it with no practice. Now the voice is an incredible plastic medium. We can speak loudly or softly and we can speak rapidly or we can speak really slowly. We modulate our voice all the time and yet given no further instruction than please synchronize, three, two, one, these people lock together in a way that is 
mind-boggling from a movement science perspective. We find when people speak like this in synchrony, they occasionally produce a kind of error we never ever find in solo speech. That is, they will simultaneously abruptly stop speaking in response to some error or some misperception. So, we, so there are serious questions from the simple coordinated movement point of view that arise. Uh, my friend Sophie Scott and her student Kyle Jasmine have done some lovely work in London sticking people into a scanner and looking what happens in the brain when we speak in real time reciprocal interaction with the person. They find large scale changes to the activity of the brain in the condition where people speak together in unison and you don't find it when they speak with a recording and in this experiment the subjects didn't even know that there were recordings but we could see it in the brain. So being together with other people really, really matters. So we can do science here. Why is there no science here? Now I want to just hold back. Remember I had to introduce the voice as a topic. We are very interested in language. We're interested in language as something that sets humanity apart from all other species and something that we hold responsible for the origins of culture and society. But the academic study of language has unfortunately become fixated on an amodal form of understanding what's going on between people, such that if you study syntax or morphology, it doesn't really much matter whether you're dealing with spoken or written language. And writing, remember, is only 5,000 years old, and widespread literacy is much, much younger indeed. The voice has been around, however, since with the last common ancestor of the great apes and us. And this form of ritualized speaking has presumably also been around for an awful long time. So it seems that we can learn a lot about who we are from studying the collective voice. And it's no accident that we find such significant rituals at the heart of our being. For what the collective voice does, and I just want to finish with a couple of examples, is bring us into the same place at the same time. We've heard today how we can travel to Mars and to the time of the dinosaurs, but how do we actually be here now? After the recent terrorist attacks in Paris, the English and the French played a football match. I'm deliberately talking over the noise. And at the football match, they did what we frequently do, they held a moment's silence. There is no solo equivalent. If you're silent on your own, nothing happens. But if we are silent together, something very profound happens. You're watching a recording and you get sucked in. <laughs> we were all together here, right here, right now. Right? And a little over 11 months ago, I was in a room with a bunch of drunken teenagers. They were having a load of different conversations in different parts of the room. And to my complete astonishment, they suddenly dropped everything and started speaking together. The same thing was going on outside Trinity College. That then is how we get to be right here, right now, together. Thank you.